In this session, we want to look at um, a part of Mark that has to do with what I'm calling servant discipleship. And that means, in the short term at least, we're skipping over at the bottom of page 5 of this uh, shorter document that you have. There's a section called Parables in Mark. And uh, we can come back to that perhaps in the next hour uh, to, to wrap up what we would do in this session and the next one. But we did talk about some of this parabolic stuff last night having to do with Matthew's Gospel. These aren't exactly the same forms or points, but they're related. I don't want to overlook, first of all, uh, servant discipleship in Mark. And this is page 68 on your syllabus. The verses that we focus on here are found in Mark 10, 35, and 45. And I'd like to go through them sort of like we did last hour. And uh, I'll read a verse and then make a comment. Then James and John, and notice this is John chapter 10, so we're, we're getting into the very last stage of Jesus' life. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and so they're two of the three, you know, the three are Peter, James, and John. They're, they're the inner core of the twelve. Two of them, not Peter, come over and speak to him. And of course, James and John are called the sons of what? Thunder. Sons of thunder. So, you know, usually Peter gets the rap for being impetuous and forward. But let's not forget that it was James and John who uh, asked Jesus if he wanted them to call down fire from heaven to incinerate the Samaritans, uh, when there were Samarians, when they uh, dissed Jesus one day. So they had their own character problems. They came over and spoke to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do, we want you to do us a favor. And my, and my comment is that it's natural to want preferential treatment from God. It's twisted. Because we should want God to be God. We should want his kingdom to come and his will to be done. And what does our preference matter? If we're right with God, what's best from God's view will be best for us. But that's our conflict in this life. You know, we're, we're conflicted individuals until we're conformed fully to God's image in the age to come. Well, we want you to do us a favor. And there's a whole sermon right there. People coming to God wanting a preferential favor. Because, you know, they represent a group. They represent the 12. And they represent a movement. And they're supposed to be Jesus' disciples. But there we go. Verse 30, and I've got 37, but we better read 36 too. What is your request, he asked. They replied. Oh, no, nothing big. When you sit on your glorious throne... We want to sit in places of honor next to you. One on your right and the other on your left. And, 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 you know, we're really, really humble. You could put either one of us either place. You know, we're not asking for the moon. <laughs> it's natural for some to want power over others. Not only do they want to be next to Jesus, they want to be next to him in power. You know, the more you think about this, you, you, the more you think, this is really sick. But it's also very natural, and it's very human. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering? And that's this translation in, in Greek. It just says, are you able to drink the cup? I'm about to drink. And the reason they put in, in this paraphrase, their bitter cup of suffering is because if you study cups in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, there are different kinds of cups. There are just cup cups, and there are cups of honor, and then there are cups that are the outpoured wrath of God. There are the, the bitter cups of judgment. And uh, when Jesus talks about cup with respect to his own, the end of his life, he's talking about He's, he's trafficking in the image of God uh, administering the cup of judgment to sinners or to the wicked or to his enemies. Are you able to drink the cup I'm about to drink? 
Are you able to be baptized with the baptism I'm about to be baptized with? Again, uh, they, they supply the words of suffering. Jesus doesn't say the baptism of suffering, but they're, they're saying they would have understood that. Now, I don't think they did understand that. I think cup and baptism were still ambiguous symbols to them. And I think they remembered later he said that, but I think this is, this is Jesus' parabolic mode of communicating. He says things that are perfectly true, but he knows, I couldn't explain it to you if I had the time. So he just says the things that are dead true, and then later on they get the fuller meaning. And, you know, the obliviousness, even if he put suffering in, I don't think it would have made a difference, they, they said, oh yes, we're able. Uh, my first comment for 38 is, God doesn't go along with wrong-headed human demands. You know, this is the fallacy of some simplistic views of prayer, that if we come to God with the right formula, whatever you ask, you will receive. Uh, number one, not if you're asking outside the will of God, not if you're asking something that God doesn't have any intention of doing. And here, you're seeing people seriously, and I think in another gospel, the mother's involved in this, um, you're seeing people who are asking for something that's it's a total category mistake. You know, they're asking, they're literally asking for the moon. Well, God's not in the business of hurting people by granting to them things they couldn't handle if it were granted to them, and in many cases as this, it can't be granted to them. And with respect to verse 39... Even wizened disciples can be self-deluded. They thought they were able. Uh, the first thing that has to be said there is they weren't qualified. Jesus' drinking of the cup, Jesus' baptism, this, of course, is uh, his passion. And uh, you had to be sinless. For Jesus' crucifixion to mean anything in the way of forgiving sin, it had to be the just for the unjust. And James and John are sinners. Jesus' death was not a martyrdom. And a lot of people today, they don't, you know, they've, they've given up on that because they, they don't read the Old Testament anymore. The Old Testament victims weren't martyrs. The Old Testament victims were sacrifices for sin, and here's this word proleptic again, they anticipated the sacrifice for sin. The Old Testament sacrificial animals were a proleptic sort of um, foreshadowing of what Jesus would do when he died for sin, and he had to be a sinless offering. And he was. And they said, we're able you know, we can go through with it. We can do, Jesus, whatever it is that you're going to have to, we can, we can do it. And, you know, it's a wonder he didn't guffaw <laughs> because they're of a, of a different uh, quality morally and spiritually than he is. 39 and 40 going on. Then Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering. Uh, James, the brother of John, after Stephen, is the next major Christian figure to die in the book of Acts. Uh, Herod has him arrested and executed. So he does, in that sense, uh, undergo Jesus' baptism because he is killed by enemies of Jesus' movement. You will indeed drink from my cup, be passed my baptism, but I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left, and I think it says in the original, just, uh, it's not for me to say, it's not for me to determine. I don't really like the translation, I have no right, because strictly speaking, I think the Son has every right to do everything that the Father does. The question isn't the rights of the Son, 
the question is propriety and the division of labor between the father and the son. That's why it says in the original, it's not given to me. This is not, this, my job description is not to make this particular decision. That's made by God the Father, not my department. God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. Uh, there are ironies in Christ's service, but some things are in the hand of the Father and not the Son. So on the one hand, he says, you aren't able. And on the other hand, he says, you'll do it. <laughs> it's kind of ironic. You know, it's both true and untrue that they could or could not drink uh, his cup and share in his baptism. Uh, and by ironies, we could also say complexities. If you follow Jesus, you'll be scratching your head a lot. You know, trying to figure things out. And maybe sometimes like Jeremiah or Job, doing a little bit of wailing. <laughs> because some things don't add up. And some things that do add up later, at the time, you, you can't compute them. They're too big for you. Or there are those things that we never figure out, I think, too, in this life. But uh, on a microcosm, we see here how things can be both and... Uh, neither nor with the disciples and their demand and what they could do and what they couldn't do. And then the last clump of verses. When the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. You know, How did they hear? Was it like secretly taped and then later on they got hold of it? Or how, how about this? Peter being one of the three, was there and, and listened to this or overheard it, and then he told the other disciples. And so the other ten then were a uh, party to this. I don't know how the other ten heard. A little birdie told them. But Jesus decided they needed a team meeting. He called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lorded over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. Uh, I used the word, I think, last night, oligarchy. In the ancient world, societies were primarily oligarchies. A few people ran everybody else, and everybody had to serve the interests of the few. That's what Jesus describes here. That's the normal social order. And it's still that way in much of the world. But among you, among Jesus' followers, there's a different social order. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. Now, he's not saying there are no leaders. <laughs> that's a big mistake that's being made today with texts like this. And people make a big thing out of servant leaders, and what they mean by that is there's no leadership anymore. It's just uh, everybody serves everybody, and, and that, that's, that's anarchy. Often what happens here is somebody doesn't like the leadership structure that's there, so they say, no, you need to be a servant leader. And once they've got that implemented, then the people who said you've got to be a servant leader, their dictates become what it is that leads the group. <laughs> the biggest advocates of the servant leaders, they want to be the leaders. That's why they attack the leaders and say, no, you're supposed to be a servant. They want to lead themselves. And they use this as a sword to get at that. But Jesus is not saying there's no such thing as apostles, there's no such thing as authority, there's no such thing as the leaders. He's talking about the mentality and the character and the M.O., of his disciples. If you want to be a leader, he could have put, look at me. <laughs> it's not that I have no authority, and it's not that I'm not doing the job that God has given to me. It's that my whole mentality is to equip you, and in the end, to die for you, and to serve you in the way that God has ordained for me to do. And God is ordaining for you to serve other people, and to be a leader for God, it's going to be a capacity of service. Just like every parent knows, if you're a good parent, think of how you serve your children. You know, from, from even before the diapers. Uh, women know increasingly how careful you have to be with your diet to, do, to be right, do right by your children when you're pregnant. There are things you need to avoid and things you need to, you know, I don't know, vitamin supplements or whatever. 
there's a lot of ways of caring for your child before they ever come into the world. And that's part of the service and the sacrifice of a good parent. And it's not the way of the world for rulers, Jesus says. They lord it over people. They flaunt their authority. But among you, whoever wants to be first must be the servant or the slave of everyone else. Now, that's not the best translation, but we, we can, you know, I don't want to get into a lot of translation uh, criticism here. Um, the example in 45, I think, is the point. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Christ's followers find reasons to oppose and bicker with each other, but Jesus' example and purpose model a higher way. And uh, this brings us back to Mark's gospel and the symbol of the ox. And, you know, this is sort of like ground zero of that whole idea of uh, Jesus' own precedent and precept regarding what service in God's household is all about. I think we have time to uh, touch on this other part, Mark 12. Uh, the widow who drops her bit into the offering plate, so to speak. It says, Jesus sat down near the collection box and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. And, of course, the disciples are watching Jesus watch. I think this is a teach teaching moment. Symbolizing God's watchful eye over all human dealings, Jesus was a people observer. And what does he see in what we offer him? You know, think of yourself and your offerings and the fact that God sees all these things. 43 through 44, Jesus called his disciples to him and said... I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. Which, quantitatively, I mean, no, she wasn't. She's given pennies. And they were giving thousands of dollars. They gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. So God looks on the heart. And he can multiply the widow's might beyond what the impious wealthy can leverage their holdings to achieve. And God's looking for that widow. <laughs> because he can do amazing things with what look like pitiable offerings if they come from a heart that is really in sync with God. We labor in humble faithfulness, believing that God will make rich use of whatever we are permitted to offer. And I close with this example of somebody who did a fair bit of good in his life, but whose, uh, whose influence, it, it's a thousandfold or ten thousandfold more since his death, which was a martyrdom, than when he lived. And that's Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And uh, I'm borrowing here, but I think I'm not quoting unless these are in quotation marks. In 1945, German pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer was hanged by the neck for his part in a plot to assassinate Hitler. And uh, you may have seen Eric Metaxas's book, Bonhoeffer, Pastor, Martyr, Prophet, Spy. He wrote on December 19, 1944, these words to his young fiance whom he would not live to see again, much less marry. I live in a great unseen realm of whose real existence I am in no doubt. You know, he was in prison in Nazi Germany, but he saw himself as a subject in the kingdom of God. And that was in December. In April of the next year, at Easter, um, the prison guards were dragging this group of guys around trying to avoid Allied bombers and imprisonment because Hitler still had uh, a grudge against these prisoners. But these prisoners, including an atheist, begged Bonhoeffer, who was a Lutheran minister, to lead worship for them on a Sunday morning. 
they were in some schoolhouse or, or someplace uh, going here and there in this old wood-burning truck. And uh, Bonhoeffer finally consented. He, you know, there were Catholics in the group, and there was an atheist in the group, and he said, you know, I don't want to force a Protestant service on this group of people. But they, you know, they're all going, no, please, don't worry about us, just, just do it. So he did it. And for his text, the, le the, uh, the, le the lectionary reading for that week was from 1 Peter. And so he preached a sermon on this biblical text. Blessed be, it should say, not blessed by, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, we've been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He preached his sermon. I'm sure the agents were right outside the door listening. They let him finish. He gave a closing ministerial prayer, and at that time the door opened, and Gestapo agents came in and they said, Prisoner Bonhoeffer, get ready to come with us. His last recorded words that he uttered to a friend as he was led away were these words, this is the end. For me, the beginning of life. And for Bonhoeffer, death had not been the end of Jesus. He believed Jesus was resurrected. He had just preached the resurrection of Jesus to men condemned to die. And so he was convinced that his best days were ahead of him. And uh, Jesus knew there was something better than sitting at his right hand and left hand and having a lot of political power in the world. Something much better would be to follow him as a servant in the sure hope of the resurrection. I'll see you after a short break. Mm -hmm.